Hello, hello everybody, and welcome back. Today we're talking about post-processing effects. Post-processing effects come in all shapes and sizes. Some slightly tweak the visuals of your game, while others can define a game's aesthetic. Godot comes with some post-processing effects, but today we're gonna go beyond the basics. In this video we're gonna learn how custom post-processing effects work, how to set them up, and we're even gonna build a couple of effects of our own. In case you only wanna use custom post-processing effects and have no interest in building your own, I'll leave some timestamps in the description that you can use to skip to the setup parts of the video. But beware, there are two different types of post-processing effects in Godot, and each require a different setup. I'm gonna explain what they are and why in this video, so I encourage you to watch the whole video through. What are post-processing effects, and how do they work? Post-processing effects are shaders that are applied to a frame after Godot has rendered it. Meaning first Godot will render out your scene as a frame, and then hand it off to a shader that will modify that frame. A post-processing effect shader is a piece of code that runs for every pixel in the frame, tweaking that pixel or completely changing it using its functions and parameters. Godot post-processing effect shaders usually come in two different flavors, 2D or canvas item shader and 3D or a spatial shader. For the sake of simplicity, we refer to canvas item shaders as 2D shaders from now on and spatial shaders as 3D shaders. The difference between these two types of shaders, at least from a post-processing effect standpoint, are that the 2D post-processing effect shader only has access to the final rendered frame, while the 3D post-processing effect shader also gains access to a normal roughness and depth texture. The normal roughness and depth textures contain information on the angle of the surface that we're rendering, its roughness, and the distance from the viewport to that surface. 3D scenes can use both 2D and 3D post-processing effect shaders, while 2D scenes usually only benefit from 2D shaders, as they don't have any depth, roughness, or normal textures. 2D post-processing effects. 3D and 2D post-processing effects both have their own unique setup. For our 2D post-processing effects, we're gonna use the canvas layer method. This is the method that I prefer, and it's also the one used in the official docs of Godot, so that's why we're going with this. All right, let's set it up. First, we'll open our 2D scene that we wanna apply the effect to. I'll use this demo scene. By the way, every scene, demo, and shader shown in this video will be in the project linked in the description. So now that we have our scene open, let's add a canvas layer node. As a child of the canvas layer node, we'll add a color rex. And we'll set its anchor preset to fully cover the screen here. Next, we want to select the color rect, go into the inspector under canvas item, and create a new material for the color rect. We'll create a shader material and click on new shader and save this shader in the shaders folder within our project. To edit the shader, we'll open up the shader editor at the bottom of Godot. Next, for demonstration purposes, we'll grab this CRT shader from go.shaders.com and paste it in our shader editor. Perfect, our setup seems to be working. But beware, in this setup the effect will apply to everything on screen, that's including UI elements. In most cases, we want to exclude our UI from the post-processing effects. This is very easily done by adding a second canvas layer node and adding our UI elements in there. When clicking on any canvas layer node, you can see their index. This is the order in which they are rendered. So always make sure your UI layer is above your post-processing effects. All right, now let's have a go at building our own. If this is your first time using shader language in Godot, I highly recommend checking out a basics tutorial. Shader language is not the same as GD script, and it definitely requires some getting used to. No prior knowledge of shader language is required, but I highly recommend it for this tutorial. Let's create our first effect. We'll create a super basic color filter effect for this example. First, we're gonna need that rendered frame that I was talking about earlier, or basically just a texture of what's on screen. We'll do this with this line. Above our fragment function and below our shader type declaration, we'll add a new line saying uniform sampler 2D screen underscore texture colon hint underscore screen underscore texture comma repeat disabled comma filter nearest semicolon. All right, let's break this line down. It's quite a big one. 
As I explained before, this shader will run for every pixel on the screen. Uniform basically states that this variable will be the same for every time the shader runs. Sampler2D is basically just a variable type for a texture in shader language. Then screen underscore texture, that's just the name of a variable that can be whatever we want. And then comes the colon. And after this are what we call hints. Hints help the compiler understand what a variable is used for or how it's intended to be used. Our first hint behind this variable is hint screen texture. That will tell Godot to put that screen texture into this variable. So here we are signing our texture already. Then repeat disabled will mean that if we draw outside of this texture, it won't be repeated like an infinite loop. And finally, filter nearest is the texture filtering we're applying to this texture. All right, let's move on. The shader can only output one pixel at a time, its current pixel, but it doesn't actually know the value of this pixel before it modifies it. All it is given is this screen texture that we just declared and a coordinate on this screen texture that corresponds to its pixel. So the next thing we're gonna do is combine the screen texture and our assigned coordinate to get the value of the current pixel we're trying to modify. So within our fragment function, we'll create a new vec tree or vector tree. A vector tree is usually used for a point in 3D space with an X, Y, and Z value. But in this case, we're gonna store our red, green, and blue value of the pixel in here. So vector tree, we'll call it color, and then we'll set it equal to a texture function. And in there, we're gonna pass our screen texture variable and an all caps screen UV variable. This is the coordinate for our current pixel. Behind the texture function, we'll add .rgb because we're only interested in the red, green, and blue values of this pixel. They also contain an alpha channel or transparency. We don't care about that right now. So we'll just grab the red, green, and blue values. Then to demonstrate that this is working, let's output this value. We do this with the all caps color variable. We'll just say all caps color, and then we'll set it equal to our own color variable and end with a semicolon. And now you can see nothing has changed to the final picture. That's because we're not modifying anything. But now every pixel on screen will first go through this function before it gets outputted to the final image. So let's apply our color filter effect. Above our output, so above our all caps color line, color.g equals 0.0, .0 and we'll add color.b equals 0.0. .0. And now when we save this, you'll see the whole picture just turned red. That's because we eliminated the green and blue values of every pixel on the screen and we're only outputting the red. This is our very basic color filter effect. This demonstrates how you can take the screen texture, move it into a function, modify its value, and then output it back again. All right, that's our first effect done. Let's try something a little more advanced. The next effect we're gonna build is this underwater effect often seen in video games. In this shader, I wanna demonstrate the three following points. First off, UV coordinates in shaders go from zero to one. No matter the dimensions or the aspect ratio of the texture that we're working with, it's always zero to one on the width and zero to one on the height. The second thing I want to demonstrate is that these post-processing effect shaders can only output their own pixel, but they can sample from anywhere on the screen or any other texture or value that you pass along to it. And finally, I want to demonstrate the time variable. That's all caps time, and it's a variable that grows as time goes along. It's where a lot of the magic of animated or moving shaders come from, and I think they're just a lot of fun to play around with. So let's put these three points into an example, and let's make this distortion slash underwater effect. First, I'll give you a broad outline of how this effect is gonna work. We will add a second texture to our shader and set it to a noise texture. Then we'll sample the second texture using our screen UV coordinate, automatically setting it to the screen size because of this zero to one coordinate system. And then we will offset the screen pixel that we sample by the intensity of the noise at that point. This will distort the final image based on the intensity of the noise. And finally, we'll scroll that noise texture across the screen using that time variable, resulting in our final effect. All right, let's build it. First, we'll remove the part where we set the green and the blue value of our color to zero. Then we'll add a new texture. Under our screen texture, we'll add a new line saying uniform sampler 2D noise texture colon repeat enabled. Because for this texture, we want it to repeat when you draw out of bounds so we can infinitely scroll it using that time variable. Next, let's get the noise value of the current pixel that we're trying to draw. We'll do this by copying the line where we get our color and just replace color with noise color and screen texture with noise texture. Next, let's offset that screen UV in the line where we get our pixel color by the noise intensity. So behind screen UV, we'll add a plus, open parentheses, and we'll add noise color.b. We'll only use the blue channel of the noise texture because we don't need every color, we just need one. They're all the same anyway, so we'll just use B. 
Then we'll divide this by 20. Make sure you add a 0 0.0 after this so it remains afloat. And then we'll close the parentheses. Now you will see nothing has changed yet. That's because we need to assign that noise texture. So let's go into our inspector, into our color rect, and under the material, you'll see a new tab, shader parameters. In here, we're gonna define our noise texture. You click on empty and select noise texture, then open that up and all the way at the bottom where it says noise, create a new fast noise light. We're also gonna to wanna to enable seamless so we can scroll that texture without there being an obvious seam. And there you go, the image will distort. The last thing we'll have to do is offset it by that time variable. This is again, very easy. Just like we did in that color line where we offset it by the noise intensity, we're gonna do exactly the same for the noise color, only we're gonna offset it by the time variable and not by the noise intensity. So after screen UV in that line, we'll add plus, open parentheses, time, and we'll divide this one by 10 so it just doesn't move that fast, and then we'll close parentheses. All right, that's the effect done. I think a fun exercise would be to combine these two uh, effects that we built so far. So you can add a blue tint to the underwater effect. You can do that by using the last effect and combining it with this one. But I'm gonna let you figure that out for yourself. We're gonna move on to 3D post-processing effects. 3D post-processing effects. The setup for 3D post-processing effects is a little different, but in the end, it will work the same. We're gonna set up a quad, basically just a plane, and this will act as our filter. Just like that color rect acted as a filter in the 2D scene, this plane or 3D quad will act as our filter here, almost like a piece of colored glass that when we look through it, we'll see the effect, and when we look next to it, we won't see it. So let's set up this quad. First, we'll add a geometry instance node. Then within the inspector, we'll set its mesh equal to a quad. We'll change its size to two by two, enable flip faces, and we'll set its extra curl margin in Geometry Instance 3D visual range to the largest value we can set it. We do this so the renderer never thinks that the quad is off screen, so it stops rendering it. Now for us to see this effect, we're gonna to need to look through this quad. We could, for example, make it a child of the camera in the scene, so it's always in front of the camera, but we can also do this in a small vertex shader. This is a piece of shader code that applies to the vertices of a mesh. But first, let's test our setup. I again grabbed the post-processing effect of go.shaders.com that utilizes the normal texture, a texture we can only use in this 3D slash spatial shader, and then created a new surface material overwrite in our quad material and set it to a shader material, created a new shader and pasted our effect in. All right, perfect. You can see our quad is now mounted to the viewport of the editor and it will also be mounted to any camera. This is because of that little piece of vertex shader code. Before we move on, I wanted to give a little warning. We're about to get into trust me bro territory. Spatial shaders or 3D shaders and depth maps, uh, normal maps and roughness maps are a lot more complicated than just basic 2D shaders. For example, the depth texture, a texture that shows the distance from the geometry to the viewport, is not as simple as it might appear. They come non-linear, and in order to make them usable, we'll have to convert them to linear space. This conversion is quite complicated, and it's even different if you're rendering in OpenGL or in Vulkan. So in order for this video to stay on topic, I've written a base shader. This shader handles the depth texture, uh, extracts the normal and the roughness texture, and sets up this vertex shader so the quad is always mounted to the viewport, and all of this so these textures are in a usable and understandable way for us to create effects. However, this shader is very oversimplified. You can do a lot more with these effects, and this is just a learning base platform, but if you want to get serious about writing custom post-processing effects, please do your own research and get your own understanding of how these conversions, textures and operations work. All right, this base shader is included in the project down below. In here, we get easy access to the normal texture, the depth texture and the roughness texture. I also included a variable that controls the depth texture's range. This variable can be tweaked from within the inspector using this slider. All right, let's build our last effect for today. We'll create a simple fog effect. As you will remember, in our 2D shaders, our output was set in that all caps color variable. In 3D shaders, we'll use an all caps albedo variable. It works the same, it's just called different. With this base shader, creating a fog effect is quite simple. In here we have our base color, that just gets our screen color, and we'll have our linear fog. The linear fog is given in a single float, and we want a vector tree for that RGB value to be able to output it. So we'll create a vector tree name it fog and set it equal to a vector tree with our linear depth as the value. 
Notice how we only need to pass linear fog once in the vector tree function. And this is because when you only pass it one variable, it will just set that variable for all the values, the x, y, and the z. Now, in order to test this, let's just output our fog as the albedo, like this. And then when we tweak that depth range, you can see how the depth texture is working. Now, the only thing we'll have to do is wherever this texture is black, so near to the camera, we want to change it with that screen texture. So when it's near, we'll see a screen texture, and when it's far away, we'll see that fog. This is very easily achieved. We'll just create a new vector tree called final color and set it equal to our fog plus our base color. And then we'll output that final color. All right, perfect. That's our very oversimplified fog shader done. All the examples we cover today are quite basic for post-processing effect shader standards but I believe they demonstrate nicely how these types of shaders are used and made. In the project linked below, I've added all of my shaders and some more post-processing effects I found online. They are a lot of fun to play around with, and some of them are very small and actually quite easy to understand. One last thing I wanted to note on is how to multipass these post-processing effects, aka stacking them on top of each other. For 2D post-processing effects, this is very simple. We can simply create as many canvas layer nodes as we want and add the effects in there. And we can control the order in which the effects are drawn based on the index of the canvas layer. Just make sure your UI layer is always on top. For 3D post-processing effects, it's a little different. You can go into your quad and under the shader material, you can see a next pass parameter. And there you can add another shader material. And this way you can stack them on top of each other. However, this is definitely not a perfect solution. This solution only works if you're utilizing the alpha channel of the shader meaning that on the points where the shader is active, it sets its alpha, and otherwise it sets its alpha to zero, meaning it will become transparent. In those cases, it will work, but most shaders override the whole screen texture, and in those cases, it sadly will not work. There are already open proposals on the go.github to add a proper feature for multipassing spatial shaders. If anybody knows a better method to do this now, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to learn. I couldn't find anything, but yeah, that's what we got so far. All right, that's it for today. I hope you learned something about custom post-processing effects in Godot. I hope you create some cool effects and definitely throw them onto go.shaders.com and link me. I would love to see your stuff. A lot more can be done with these shaders than I explained here. You can see other post-processing effects and you can see what I mean. But all right, this was a comprehensive guide to custom post-processing effects in Godot. My name is Lucky and I'll see you next time. Bye.